Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here today, Simona. You always invite us. And thank you, everyone, because as I said before, I think that the urgency and after the scenario we have seen in the first session, especially in terms of inequalities regarding those who ha can compete and can deploy technological infrastructure in society and the control of these infrastructure. Well, I think it's more urgent than ever to start asking questions, but also starting to be more specific regarding solutions and to fight and find alternative models because at the end of the day digital society is absolute. I would like to make three comments. The first one is to place a bit of a context. Florin and Andrea explain this really well when we talk about internet and what is digital. We're not only talking about a cloud, we're not only talking about data, we're talking about materiality infrastructure, cables, servers, machines that have owners and as you have seen they have names and last names, not many unfortunately. They are companies who are centralizing all the technologic power and the power of global economy because it's not only the companies that control the technological market but they are also the most powerful companies in the world. So I know I'm oversimplifying things here, but that is how it is. So the technological companies are there in the front line. Additionally, it is also important to stress the element of infrastructure because oftentimes when we talk about digital, it seems that we're talking about abstract things, but climate emergencies, servers, machines, infrastructure, all this pollutes and there's material production generating dependency on materials that are scarce. So the technological crisis is also related to the climate crisis. Simona mentioned that we'll talk on a more positive note tomorrow. It's sometimes difficult to be optimistic on this scenario because if we look at the software layer, at the data layer, the layer that sustains and supports below the material, or what's material, the scenario is also um, quite unfortunate. Great technological companies are the ones that support all this. We all use them, they're deployed in our pockets in our devices and with no type of democratic control they are designing uh, or covering a huge part, a uh, small part of the world, Silicon Valley and Shenzhen, China too, which is another place or center where technology is designed and this is designed with the only purpose of maximizing profit. How do we do this? Maximizing attention how do I keep you in hooked in the app for a longer time so that you have interaction with others? This gives me lots of value and lots of money. In democratic terms, this is very concerning. And despite this, to the question, and this is what we do in the project, to the question of how the democratic control of this infrastructure should be, but how can we develop infrastructure, mm, digital democratic infrastructure that are sovereign and controlled by all citizens? I would also like to speak favorably about imagining potential futures that are not only thinking about collapse or the end of society, the individualization, war, the destruction of the planet, but imagining futures that place life collaboration and the capacity of building other 
technologies, the service of people at the center, as well as other possible futures that are more hopeful. So let's land in the world of education. The world of education, of course, is affected by this digital transformation. We're seeing this, and we will see this throughout the three days. And we are always moving between two poles. There's the uh, disastrous pole, technologies are evil, we have these addiction problems multinationals are controlling this and then we have the naive techno optimism saying we will just place an app here and it will solve all the problems that we have in schools in terms of complexity diversity and attention but unfortunately despite these opposed perspectives we are um, always trying to stand at the surface and risks are high. The risk of privatization of structures, which is an uncovered way of privatization of public education, of course. But we're also seeing the risks in terms of what is happening with the contents in the network, the users of platforms. Just to mention some powers. We have opportunities, it's not all risks out there. So in this horizon of technological sovereignty and having control over what is happening on digital spheres, internet and digital networks have always been a source of inspiration for many people who come from activism of networks, hacktivism, because precisely internet, as uh, Simona was saying, is founded upon democratic principles, sharing knowledge and collaboration between peers. It's also relates it to the fact how we share or prepare shared platforms to decentralized power. And when we talk about education, this is also an asset, understanding internet, the network and technologies from their cooperative and technical standpoint, computational thinking, new ways of collaboration. This is a window that opens to principles and practices that should be a resource to transform the education of the future. So, what is Democratic Digitali? We have three days to discover this, and Simona has explained how we have made this collaboration possible with the City Council of Barcelona in this case. But the first thing I wanted to talk about the democratic digitalization. This is something I want to defend and this is a project stemming from families. Families that are concerned about this topic, what is happening with the data of their children, FAC, Xnet and the organized civil society that raises their hand and says this is not tolerable. We have risks. We don't know what is happening. We do not have alternatives. And I'm saying this because it is essential to acknowledge where things come from and without this it's very difficult to have things rise and escalate. So the first idea is that this democratic digitalization was born at the bottom and then grew, so it's a bottom-up process. The second essential process, especially when code is prepared in public administration, is a free software program that uses free licenses, open licenses everyone can see, copy, audit, modify, and distribute. And this is how all the software coming from public administration should be done. And this is not happening. We are going for private solutions offered by the market simply because that's what it is. And it's not a matter of alternatives because there's always alternatives. It's just a movement that, that we have, this inertia, political inertia in many cases. There's the will to continue feeding the great technological companies and operators, of course, but unfortunately it's very hard 
to uh, have this investment. So this DD is a free software, open software project that wants uh, for everyone to use this code. The third idea is that DD is a project that wants to be 100% or wants to uh, uh, guarantee 100% of the rights of the people, especially the most vulnerable people, children and minors. We don't want students to be profiled. We don't want to have data profiling there to spy on them, sell advertising or whatever predictions can be done in short in a short amount of time for data processing prediction accelerated systems so we need to have systems that guarantee that those tools are going to be solely for the purpose they'd be meant for which is to facilitate learning and educational environments the fourth idea and for me, this is a very powerful one, is the idea of technological sovereignty or autonomy, which is basically the capacity to build our own tools. Why do we need Google or Microsoft if we have solutions that not only do they exist in our solvent, but also can be constantly improved and adapted to our needs? We can build them based on what we need. Who knows? the needs of the lecturers and students better than the educational communities themselves. So let's take or let's bring these needs closer and let's recover the connection with technology because at the end of the day, technology allows us to transform it and adapt it to our needs. But we have been drawn apart. We don't know how operating systems are made. The apps markets drift away from this relationship with technology and we need to recover it because we have the capacities and tools to develop technology that responds to our needs and that is not basically the CEO of a company in the other side of the world deciding who is going to be or what is going to be our need. And finally, DD is an educational opportunity too without a doubt because it not it should not only be an instrument or tool to facilitate the different ways to teach and learn, it needs to be an instrument to be able to, in families, in faculties and schools, all these problems, take them to all these places, talk about digital and democratic rights, technological sovereignty and all the challenges that we have ahead of us. DD is an idea of how we can do technology differently, guaranteeing rights and being right next to the people. So, and just to finish, basically this uh, new way is now opening. We hope it is a long way, a long route. Um, of course, the race now is being totally unequal. But from the Barcelona City Council, we have been trying to precisely find resources to boost, although this is not directly uh, our responsibility, but we want to boost it and show it's possible to use open source tools, reuse them and integrate them to place them at the disposal of centers and their needs. And we want to continue doing this, not only this, but also to land feasible models of doing technology differently. We know that there is a lot of work to be done. We know that public administrations, in this sense, are lagging behind of what they should be doing, but we want to start proving that we can walk this path. Thank you very much.